Good evening, family and friends. Welcome to our midweek devotional on the book of Revelation with Dr. John Oakes. Just as we heard in this opening song, the storm is passing over. No matter the trials we go through in our daily lives, let's always bear in mind that we have a just God who will be with us to the very end of the age. And those are his words. The storms will pass. And today we are about to receive some more clarity of the picture that will be revealed to all of us after the storm passes. The central message of the book of Revelation, I believe, is that God and good will prevail over all evil. Simply put, the picture that awaits us at the end of the storm is one of true hope for all those who remain faithful to Jesus Christ. So let's be excited as we dive deeper into the book of Revelation in session three with Dr. John Oakes, following which we will have Madan Matthew coordinate a short Q&A session. So do forward in all your questions to him via the chat box interface. Let's all bow our heads before we proceed further. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you for this wonderful evening, for the wonderful morning as well in the States, dear Lord. You've given us each lives to wake up this day and uh, do our things, dear Lord, one of which is to call your name, dear Lord, to praise you and to worship your Father. Dear Father God, we give you all the glory, we give you all the praises, Lord. Uh, dear Lord, I pray this evening uh, for Brother John. Uh, may you be able to um, fill him with your wisdom to be able to speak through your spirit, dear Lord. Dear Father God, I also pray for all of us who are listening to be uh, having open hearts and minds to listen to the words, to be able to use it in our lives, Father God. Dear Father God, I also at this time want to pray for all those who are sick, who are fighting uh, the COVID virus and other situations in their lives. I pray that you provide them protection, that you uh, help them recover from all of the situations they are in, dear Lord. Dear Father God, be with us, fill us with your spirit, help us to remain faithful to you all the way to the very end, Father God. Thank you for this time. In Jesus Christ's mighty name, I pray all this. Amen. So are we ready to start? By the way, that was a great introduction, Aaron. That, that was really wonderful. I, uh, I, we, we need to realize that the book of Revelation is written not so that we could interpret end times, but so that we could know how to endure troubling times. And of course, this has been a troubling time. So uh, that, that was a great introduction. I really appreciate that, Aaron. Okay, so let's get back into it. Uh, I got to start the tape here. Okay, great. So this is session number three. Uh, the first session we introduced the idea of apocalyptic literature, uh, end time interpretation, things like that. And then we, we looked at our prologue, the scene of, of, of John on the island of Patmos. And then last week we went through uh, Revelation chapter two and three, uh, which is uh, Jesus letters to the seven churches in Asia. Today, really honestly, Today, we actually start the book of Revelation in many ways because uh, the first three chapters are introduction and then sort of practical application. But with chapter four, uh, the book really starts. It's the opening scene. So uh, this is a great, should be a, a good class today. I'll remind you, although Aaron pretty much already did it, of the theme, message, and objective of the book of Revelation. Peel back the layers of history. Even the terrible persecutions, uh, the difficulties the church is going through, the seeming defeats, and what do we see? The Lamb is, is on the throne. God is in control. The message of Revelation is that we should be encouraged and faithful to Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord. The purpose then is to comfort persecuted Christians or Christians who are going through challenging, difficult times. <clears throat> Revelation is apocalyptic literature. It's, it's like a picture book, a divine picture book, uh, representing the historical development of the church in the first few centuries. That's the context, but designed for us as well. The book of Romans appeals to the mind, the book of Psalms appeals to the heart, but Revelation appeals to the imaginations. Great. 
So let's open our Bibles to Revelation 4. Hope you all are doing well today. It's only 102 degrees. It's only about uh, 39 degrees today in uh, uh, Bakersfield, so we're doing well. All right. After this, I looked, and this is after the letters to the seven churches. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. I will show you what must take place after this. So we need to let our imagination engage the situation. Let's look at the big picture. Remember, when we're looking at apocalyptic literature, we don't want to get caught up in every single detail. We need to get the big picture. We'll talk about the details, but we won't get hung up on them. What's the big picture? Remember the message, God is on the throne. Stay faithful to the end. No matter the trial, no matter the persecution, you will wear a crown and you will enter the New Jerusalem. So John looks into heaven and basically the movie begins. And just imagine a big door opening. Not a literal door, but it's a picture. And what do we see? We see God. In chapter 4 of Revelation, we see God the Father, and in chapter 5, we see Jesus the Son. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me, John chapter 14, verse 1. So we need to believe in God and believe also in him. So chapter 4 and 5 sets up the rest of the book of Revelation. This is the scene. Revelation 4 and 5 is the scene to hold in your mind throughout the entire rest of the book. The message is when we're persecuted, when we suffer, uh, when we are admonished and rebuked, we need to look to God who's on the throne. The word throne is found 38 times in the book of Revelation and 17 times in chapter four and five. What's that tell you? It tells you that Jesus is Lord, and God is on his throne. Now let's read. Let's see God. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. The one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald, emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated of them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne, there were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had the face of like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Even under its wings, day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So here's your picture of God on his throne. We see jasper, which is a, a white stone, representing God's holiness. Then we see a ruby or carnelian color, which represents God's justice, his righteousness. And then we see a rainbow, which represents God's promise or his covenant. Genesis 9, 12 through 17, it describes it as being like an emerald. Green is the dominant color in God's rainbow, representing life, representing hope. Around the throne with this brilliant light, with the jasper and the carnelian and the, and the, and the rainbow, 
We have 24 elders. Who are these elders? Well, there are 12 apostles, and there were 12 patriarchs, the 12 sons of Jacob. So it, basically, it represents the priesthood of all believers. In fact, in the, uh, in the temple, there were 24 courses of priests, 24, which is, of course, 12 times 2. No accident. So basically, essentially, God is on the throne, and we are witnesses sitting around the throne figuratively. Jesus said this would happen to the apostles. In Matthew 19, 28, he said, you will be sitting on 12 thrones, dressed in white with golden crowns. So pictures in heaven. And the imagery comes from the temple. It's a picture of the heavenly tabernacle. Remember, in, in Hebrews 9, it says that, that, that the, and also in Hebrews 8, it says the earthly tabernacle is just, it's just a shadow. It's just a, a, a model of the real one, the one that's in heaven. So that's where we are now. And what do we see? We see the 24 elders, which is essentially witnesses representing God's people around the throne. And then we see four cherubim. Who are these cherubim? All right, the cherubim are, are powerful, powerful creatures. And, you know, we, our, our thought is angels as, as sort of, you know, angelic, probably more feminine than masculine, uh, you know, nice. And No, no, no. Cherubim are fearful creatures. The, the four creatures in the Holy of Holies, this is all from the imagery in the temple. And then there are the seven lamps. The seven lamps represent the Holy Spirit. We have the Father, we have the Holy Spirit. What's missing? Well, the Son, but that's going to be in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we're going to have this dramatic entry of the Son of God into the throne. So the 24 elders represent the 24 courses of priests who serve in the temple of the living God. In 1 Chronicles 24, 3 through 19, it lists those 24 course of priests. We have a picture of power, a picture of authority, and security for those loved by God. And we see the judgment of God represented by the lightning and the rumblings of thunder. God will judge his enemies. The Jews, when they hear about the lightning and the thunder, would be brought back immediately to Exodus 19.16, where, uh, where the scene on Mount Sinai, where there's, there's smoke and, and lightning and, and thunder, and, and, and people were trembling. We have the seven lamps, the seven spirits. And, of course, in the menorah, in the temple, there were the seven lamps there, representing the Holy Spirit. In verse 6, around the throne, there's this sea of glass uh, uh, representing the holiness, the purity of God. All right? And basically representing the holiness. Because everything in this scene is about the power of God, about the righteousness of God, about the holiness of God. And the sea, this crystal sea separates us. You have to imagine us on the other side of the sea, looking in at this scene. This sea represents the separation between us and God. It's a thing that unholy things cannot cross. It's interesting because in Revelation 21, 1, when we have the final scene at the end of Revelation, the sea is no longer there. And then we have free access to walk into the throne room. The four living creatures covered with eyes on every side, which represents that God's angels, they know what's going on around the whole world. They, they, they defend God's holiness. They're always watchful to defend God's holiness and also to worship God. Might they be the four seraphim of Isaiah 6, verse 2? Or more likely, they're the four cherubim of Ezekiel 1, 5 through 14. In Ezekiel 1, the four faces are a man, a lion, 
an ox, and an eagle. And here, the same four creatures in a different order. Here, um, there it's lion, ox, man, and equal, an eagle. And these, rep these creatures represent the power. We have the lion, the most powerful creature of, of, of the earth. The eagle, the most powerful creature of the air. And then the ox, the most powerful creature of, of, the, of the field. And then, of course, man. These cherubim are the same ones who God put around the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve sinned, the four cherubim were around the garden saying, no, you do not have access to God anymore. These are the same cherubim whose images were sewed into the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And basically those cherubim said, no way. You do not have access to the throne because you're not holy, which is why it was only the high priest only once a year, only after sacrificing for his own sin, only after filling in the temple with the incense did the high priest have access, and even then only for a few minutes. What's the impression? Let's just stop and let's just imagine. How do you view God? Let's remember Revelation chapter 4 with the 24 elders, the four powerful cherubim protecting God's holiness. Right? And then worship breaks out. I'm telling you like right now, if you find worship boring, then you're not going to enjoy heaven because worship breaks out like every time you turn around, they're worshiping God. What do we have here? Holy, holy holy which is exactly what the seraphim said in isaiah 6 verse 2 holy 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 it says in verse 9 whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and they lay their crowns before the Lord and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And we say to God, holy, holy, holy. And before God, all human crowns are simply cast down. There's a, a, a Christian group called uh, Casting Crowns. I think they get their, their name from this scene. So this is the picture. Think of God throughout the, the scary situations in Revelation 7, Revelation 6, the bowls and the seals. Remember, God is on his throne protected by his cherubim with the elders worshiping him that's the throne room scene all right 24 elders representing the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles or the 12 or 24 cycles of priests thunder representing god's judgment the sea of crystal representing the holiness and separation of god from that which is unholy the four living creatures, the cherubim protecting God's holiness. All right. So, Revelation 4, trust in God. Revelation 5, trust also in me. So, let's read uh, the first part of Revelation chapter 5. Here we meet Jesus, the lion and the lamb. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides sealed with seven seals and i saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll but no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it this is john he says i wept and i wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside it then one of the elders said to me do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, 
the root of Jesse has triumphed. And he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. An awesome scene. You know, you can see on the screen somebody's attempt to draw uh, what this uh, what this lamb looked like. But I'm telling you, any attempt to draw this scene is going to fall way short. So what do we have here? Well, you have a scroll written on both sides, which means a complete message. Ezekiel 2.19, a very similar scene. Right after Ezekiel meets the four cherubim, he too is given a scroll written on both sides. And I believe it represents the message of Ezekiel. And here I believe it represents the message in Revelation. It has seven seals, which means it's perfectly sealed and very difficult to open. No one was worthy. Like it says in Romans 3.10, no one is righteous, not even one. Jesus said in Mark 10.18, no one is good. No one is good except God alone. So what do we learn here? That Jesus is God. So in a sense, the picture of heaven is still closed. So who's going to open the scroll and reveal the message of Revelation? The answer is Jesus. And the image here, here is, is very interesting because Jesus is a lion and he's also a lamb. What could be more opposite than a lion and a lamb? But Jesus is a lion. When we think of Jesus as a lion, what comes to mind? A powerful ruler. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In fact, in Genesis 49, 8 through 12, Jesus is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But Jesus is the root of Jesse, which means he's the Messiah, the one who was to come. And it says that he's triumphant. Jesus is triumphant. Again, like Aaron said, we know the end of the story before it starts. We know how the story ends. God is on the throne, and Jesus is in the center of the throne room, and he is triumphant. But Jesus is a lamb. Jesus is a lion. He's a lamb. In what sense is Jesus like a lion? And in what sense is he like a lamb? Jesus is a lion to the enemies of God, but he's a lamb to the people of God. It says in, in Isaiah, a bruised reed he would not break. Jesus is gentle, and yet he's fierce. He's both. It says looking at a lamb as if he was slain, right? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who's been slain since the creation of the world, as we'll see later on in Revelation. All right, so here's the picture of a Savior whose death has made him worthy, whose de death is a triumph and an overcoming. What an amazing scene. And then we have worship. Again, we had worship in chapter 4. We're going to have worship in chapter 5. We're going to have worship in chapter 7. And worship is going to break out. Again, like I said, if you don't enjoy worship, probably heaven is not the place for you. And here we have the most amazing, amazing worship. I didn't focus in on it in chapter 4, but I just want to take some time to look at the worship of the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of Jesse. What do we have? The, the elders are holding harps. By the way, you know, the picture, of course, we always see angels holding harps, right? 
Angels never hold harps anywhere in the Bible. Do angels have harps? I don't know. I have no idea. One thing I know is the only uh, thing ever holding a harp in the Bible is the elders in Revelation chapter 5. That's kind of interesting little, nice little fact here. All right, so we have a, a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. Horns represent power. Jesus is perfectly powerful. And the lamb has seven eyes representing his knowledge. Jesus is in the center of the throne. And Jesus takes the scroll with confidence. And then worship breaks out. Jesus is God. All right. So let's read this worship. It says here, and they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy. Jesus is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God a person from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests. And uh, Exodus 19, 6, you will be a kingdom of priests. And Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And we will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. A hundred million angels. Is that the exact number? Come on, just get the picture. This is apocalyptic literature. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Let me read that again. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. Let us praise Jesus. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the saints of God say amen to that. The four living creatures said amen. And the elders, and we are falling face down and worshiping God. What's the theme song of Revelation? The theme song is worthy is the lamb. He has made us a kingdom of priests forever and ever. Hundreds of millions of angels that's the scene really th I, I, i'm just parking here in revelation 4 and 5 for a while because i want us to get this picture because honestly we're going to start into the scary part of revelation and if you forget chapter 4 and 5 you could get caught up in the details in revelation 6 through 19 and, and kind of like oh my god uh, uh, what are we going to do how, how are we going to deal with the situation and maybe you've been feeling that lately there in the gulf with all the craziness going on and the sickness and the illness even in god's people well remember because we're going to do revelation 6 all right so let's do it revelation 6 we're going to see uh the, the the lamb opening the scroll now the action begins all right here's the structure for revelation 6 through 16. First, we'll have the seven scrolls in Revelation 6 and 7. Hopefully, we can finish that today. That's as far as we'll get today. Then we'll have the seven trumpets, Revelation 8 and 9. Then we'll have the seven symbolic scary creatures, <laughs> Revelation 10 through 14. Then we'll have the seven bowls, Revelation 15 and 16. The seals, the trumpets, and bowls represent judgments of God. The seals represent partial judgment. The trumpets represent further partial judgment, but the bowls are the final overwhelming judgment on God's enemies. It's the final judgment after which the fate is sealed. All right, got it? That's the structure. 
All right, let's, we're going to have this, uh, this, this scene here. Again, uh, the next scene in the movie, a dramatic scene. I watched as the Revelation 6 1. <clears throat> excuse me. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and it was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, and fiery red one, its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to, get, and to make people kill each other. Tim was given a large sword. And when the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. His rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. All right, I like the Lego version of this. All right, let's go back to the less silly picture here. Revelation 6 1, come, come see the vision. This represents things which will soon take place. And we hear hoof, hoof beats. We see here in the distance, Horses, mighty horses, and onto the scene, first the first of the horsemen, a, a rider on a white horse. Does this represent Jesus? I don't know. Possibly. Possibly it does. Come see the vision. Horses are used by God in imagery in Zechariah 1, 8 through 11, in Zechariah 6, 1 through 8. What do we see when the first seal is revealed? We see a triumphant conqueror on a white horse. Is this Jesus? Perhaps. Through him, we are more than conquerors, Romans 8, 37. We will not be harmed by the seven seals. So Jesus comes in, all right? But then he pronounces judgment is coming. The picture of a warrior on a white horse with a golden crown and a bow. This would bring in imagery, by the way, just, you know, to the, uh, to the Romans of Parthia. Parthia will be part of the scenery of Revelation more than once. Uh, I should have, I don't think I have a map, do I? All right, we'll have a map later on. So here's Rome, which surrounded the Mediterranean, and to the, to the, uh, to the east was Parthia, the greatest power, basically Persia to us, right? Think of Persia. And they were known for coming in horses with, with bows and arrows. Think about the, um, uh, about the um, Mongols, okay? So this represents the, the power of, of war to battle against Rome. And we have um, a red horse, which represents war and bloodshed. And he's given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay one another. And he's got a large sword perhaps symbolizing the persecution which will accompany those of us who preach the gospel. Will this impact God's people? Yes. God's people will be hurt by the war that is brought in by the man on the red horse. Then the third seal, a black horse that represents famine. <clears throat> and you have a scale for measuring food and a whole day's wages. It'll take a whole day's wages just to buy some wheat, sufficient wheat to stay alive. There, but still, there's oil, there's wine. So, so the wealthy are not hurt so much by this famine. It's probably the poor and the weak and the outcasts that are hurt by this famine. Probably representing financial hardships that are going to come on the church and on the Roman Empire. And then the fourth seal. I didn't read that one, did I? Then, I, then the lamb opened the fourth seal. I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked, and there before me was a, a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades, and it was following close behind him. They were given power over one-fourth of the earth to go by sword and famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. They called out in a loud voice, 
How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. And I watched as he opened a sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black. This is classic apocalyptic literature. Like sackcloth made from goat hair, the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell from the earth. This is the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, as the figs drop from fig tree, reminiscent of Jesus' parable of the uh, uh, killing of the fig tree. When shaken by a strong wind, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks and the mountains. They called out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great and day of wrath has come. Who can withstand it? Pretty intense scene. But again, with the fourth horse, the pale horse, which represents death, as you can see in Ezekiel 14, 12 through 20. It, it's representing martyrdom. Some of the disciples are going to be martyred, are going to be killed in this persecution. How do you feel about the prospect of persecution and even death? Here in America, we, we are so, you know, so wimpy so um comfortable i think you there especially our, our disciples in yemen in sudan in saudi arabia in syria the idea of being killed for our faith it's a very real picture so we need reassurance but anyway we can see that one fourth will be killed so this represents a, a partial judgment does that mean literally one fourth of all people are going to die no, no, no. Come on. This is apocalyptic literature. Get the picture. Judgment is coming on Rome. And martyrdom is coming on the saints. That's the picture. Then the fifth seal. In the fifth seal, verse 9 through 11, we see those who've been killed because of their faith in God. The martyrs. And the martyrs are under the altar. So you have generally this would might represent the altar where of sacrifice. And when a sacrifice is made, the blood drips down and it falls into the moat around the altar. And so the fact that they're below the altar represents the fact that their blood was given as a sacrifice. And what are they saying? They're saying in verse 10, how long, sovereign Lord, before you come and judge your enemies? This is a spirit I can't really relate to. Several times, and we see this in the Psalms as well, we see God's people crying out for God to come and to judge and destroy his enemies. Honestly, this is a feeling, this is an emotion that I personally do not have. But I believe that when we're in heaven, we will say, Amen. It is right. God's judgment is just. And I believe we'll have the same perspective that these martyrs have. How long, sovereign Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth? What does God say? He says, no, you're going to have to hold off for a little while. You're going to have to wait. Judgment is coming. Psalm 94, 1 through 3, Revelation 11, 7 through 18, Revelation 16, 5 through 6, we see people crying out for God to come and to judge and destroy his enemies. Do you long to see God's vengeance on his enemies? I, I don't. But in verse 11, God says, no, you're going to have to wait. It's still going to be a little while before I come and judge. We have to wait a little while. God says that many times in Isaiah 33, 1. He says, 
you know, when Assyria is done destroying my people, then I will destroy Assyria. And in Daniel 11, 36, in Daniel 11, 45, God says through Daniel that the Roman power which attacks the saints will be destroyed. Then we see the sixth seal. We see an earthquake representing judgment. The sun turns black, the moon turns red, stars fall from the sky. Again, classic. Classic apocalyptic literature, judgment is coming, the day of the Lord is here. Isaiah 2, 10 through 21, the day of the Lord. Joel, Joel, Joel 2, 10, Joel 2, 31, the day of the Lord, the sun darkened. Don't take this literally, please. But it, it, it's real, it's not literal, but it's real. The judgment is real, the judgment is coming. And God's enemies are hiding in caves. The powerful, the prideful, the arrogant who laughed at God's people. What are they doing? They're hiding under a rock because the lamb slain from the creation of the world is coming to judge. The day of the Lord is not a happy day, not for most people. The day of the Lord is a day to fear. Revelation 6, 17, who can stand up? under this situation you know we need revelation chapter 7 right now we need a little bit of encouragement i by the way i'm going to try to end a little bit sooner this time i went a little bit too long last time we, hopefully we'll be done within about maybe 10 or 12 minutes here because i want us to get a little bit more time to take some question and answer sorry about that last week all right so revelation 7 what we have is an interlude right a period of quiet and calm and peace because right now we the people of god we need a little bit of encouragement a little bit of encouragement because uh by the way we've seen six seals correct the seventh seal hasn't been opened yet that's going to be in revelation 8. and revelation 8 the seventh seal will turn out to be the opening of the seven trumpets that's going to be the structure here Got it? So let's read Revelation 7. Revelation 7 is so encouraging, brothers and sisters. So encouraging. <laughs> you know, and given the judgment that's coming on the road, we need a little bit of encouragement. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Remember, four is the number of, of humanity, essentially. The number of earthly things. Got it? So are there literally four angels? I guess. I suppose. Uh, standing at the four corners of the earth. Does the earth have four corners? Come on now. Don't take this literally. Holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or any tree. So basically I said, all right, stop. Judgment, stop. I need to comfort my people. Keep the winds back. Keep those horses, four horses back. Because I, I, I need some time with my people to comfort them. That's the picture. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea, the forestmen, says, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 from every tribe of Israel, from Judah 12,000, Reuben 12,000, Gad 12,000, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, from the tribe of Joseph 12,000, from the tribe of Benjamin 12,000. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe and nation and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they're wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, you are, uh, and I are right there. We're wearing a white robe. And we're holding a bowl of incense, which is the prayers of the saints. So the four angels are holding back the wind 
and they're they're telling the horsemen, no, stay away. You're not allowed in here. God is having a little time with his people. An angel comes from the east and he seals the 144,000. And I, I, I'd like you to take some time, if you can, uh, this week to read Ezekiel 9, 10, and 11. Because the scene in Ezekiel 9, 10, 11 is very similar to the scene here, where God is about to judge Judah. He's going to bring judgment on the city. But before he does that, he goes through the city and he seals the righteous ones. It does not protect them from difficulty. It does not protect them from even from death, but it does protect them from judgment. Ezekiel 9, 1 through 6. In fact, let me just quickly read that because I, I think it's really instructive of what's going on here. Ezekiel 9, 1 through 6. You'll see the parallel right away. Uh, but I want to suggest you read the rest of Ezekiel 9 and also 10 and 11. Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. Kind of like the four horsemen, right? And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, with face, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a riding kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been, and it moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without mercy or compassion. Slaughter the old men, the young men, the women, the mothers, and the children, but not do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple. All right, so there's the picture. What we see here is God protecting his people. Who is protected? 144,000. Please, please, please. Do not take this literally. 12 times 12 times 1,000. If we take this literally, that means only virgin male Jews are going to be in heaven. That's ridiculous. That, that's even downright silly. Who are these 144,000? Well, just read about it in Revelation chapter 7. He tells us who they are. They are multitudes, right? They are a great multitude that no one can count from every tribe, people, uh, nation, and language. That's who they are. They're an uncountable multitude. How many are there? I don't know. Millions, for sure. Many, many millions. Again, 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. All God's people. Every single one of them. A multitude that no one could count. That's the same people. Does this ceiling mean that they will escape completely from suffering brought on by the tribulation? Uh, no, it does not. <laughs> My grandson just broke in. <laughs> Hello, grandson. Good seeing you. Anyway, good. So, it says, do not harm them. Instead, put a seal on their forehead. And what do we see? We see robes, white robes, representing the fact that we're pure, we're forgiven. Right? Amen. It, it, it's interesting, the tribes that he chooses. Why not Judah? Why, why, why Judah and Reuben? Because Judah is the tribe from whom the Messiah comes. First Judah, then Reuben. Why Reuben? Because Reuben was the one who basically uh, defended uh, Jake, uh, um, uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, it's not the same 12 tribes that are listed in Genesis. All right. Uh, there's no uh, Manasseh. There's no Ephraim. All right. There's no Dan. 
let's not get caught up in that. All right, but remember, the sealing does not mean Christians escape from suffering. No, no, no. Those, those that were sealed in Ezekiel 9, 1 through 6, you find out later in Ezekiel 21, 3 and 4, they suffered great tribulation along with God's enemies. The great multitude is those who, those who are redeemed by God. The white robes represent our purity, for our forgiveness from sins. Palm branches. Palm branches are always associated with joy. And it's reminiscent of the joy when the people laid palm branches in front of Jesus when he came into Jesus mounted on a donkey. It's a reference to the Feast of Tabernacles also. The Feast of Tabernacles, when they made those booths out of palm branches. So it represented God being among his people. And as the, as the saints are sealed, it means that God is among his people. The Holy Spirit is living in God's people. The Holy Spirit is that seal in Ephesians 1. It's the seal, the deposit, guaranteeing our salvation. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, we will be saved. Amen. And then worship breaks out again. Worship breaks out again in verse 11. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, those in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. He was just asking a rhetorical question, testing John. And John's like, not getting fooled by that. He says, you know, come on. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them, nor any scorching heat. And, and those of you who live in the summer in, in the Persian Gulf say amen and praise the Lord for that. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Again, he takes us back. We keep coming back to Revelation 4 and 5 because the Lamb is at the center of the throne. He will be our shepherd. He will lead us to springs of living water. He will send the Holy Spirit, which will be a river of living water that springs up to eternal life, which we'll see again in Genesis 22. And God will wipe every tear from their eye. Amen. What an what a awesome picture. God spreads his tabernacle over us. We are in his tent. We will dwell with him forever. Then we get to Revelation 8 and 9. Here we're going to see the, the, uh, the, 12, the seven trumpets. But we're going to end there. Uh, let's end in a brief prayer, and then we'll take some questions. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this picture of God on the throne and Jesus in the center of the throne room. Jesus, the lamb and the lion and the, and the branch of David. Thank you, God. And we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So let's stop sharing. Hopefully, I did a little bit better job of stopping on time today. Well, 52 minutes left. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother John Oaks, for the wonderful session. A very, very graphically explained. And uh, we were able to get a lot of insights. And yes, we do have some questions. So I'll uh, straight Great. away get into the questions immediately. So why... 
is Jesus referred as the morning star in Revelations 22, 16. Uh, but when I read the Old Testament, Satan in Isaiah 14, 12 is referred as the morning star. This scripture has been confusing me since I read the book of Revelation. Right. First of all, uh, you, you referred to Isaiah 14, correct? Isn't that what he said, Isaiah 14? Yes, 14. Right. Yeah, that, that's a false interpretation. Many, many people have said that that is Satan in Isaiah 14, but that's simply not true. Satan is never called Lucifer anywhere in the Bible. Okay, uh, Isaiah 14, if you look at it, it's talk about the king of Assyria. I'm preaching from uh, uh, Isaiah right now for the, the church here in Bakersfield. And so basically, a, a morning star represents a powerful king. And what he's saying in Isaiah 14 is he's saying to Assyria, representing Sennacherib or, or one of the, you know, the, the kings of Assyria, he says, your star will fall. All right? And so um, there, the, the, the morning star is never associated with the devil, with Satan. Uh, that's one of the most common misinterpretations in the whole Bible is the misinterpretation of Isaiah 14. All right, and it is true the word Lucifer is there, which means morning star, but I, I'm sorry. What you should do is read Isaiah 14, pretend you never heard that that's Satan. Just pretend you never heard that. Put that on your mind. Read Isaiah 14. You go, where did that come from? <laughs> Whoever came up with that crazy idea. All right. So then the morning star represents, uh, I, I don't know, uh, I'd have to maybe do a little bit of research there to make sure I'm speaking correctly, but it represents sort of a, a king, a, a rising king. And in this case, in, in Jesus being the morning star who rises, that's morning stars generally do rise, correct? <laughs> and so this morning star in Isaiah 14 is coming down. He's, he's losing his place of power. Okay. Mm -hmm. Amen, bro. Thank you so much for that yeah. explanation. Uh, the next question, when John was showed in chapter 5, verse 10, that the saints will reign on earth, it's clear that this is not yet eternity in heaven. If Revelation, with the exception of Revelation 21, has essentially been fulfilled already in the past, which period does Revelation 5, 10, Refer to what was the time period when Christians reigned on earth? All right, uh, Revelation five ten, correct? Yes. Yeah. All right, let me get there. Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, the idea that heaven is this place up in the sky you know, where, where we're going to be. That's a false concept. Uh, heaven and earth, it's the same thing. The earth, we will reign on the earth. Uh, and you know, basically, in, in Revelation 21, uh, there's a new heaven and a new earth. So before, heaven was here, earth was here, and they come, and that they're now the same thing. The, the, or, heaven has come down to earth. We will rule on the earth. We will have physical bodies. So when is this? It's one of those already but not yet things. Because when, when Jesus died and was raised, essentially the kingdom of God came. And, you know, so, you know, when we're baptized into Christ, we're saved already but not yet. When we're baptized into Christ, we're saved, and yet we're being saved, and yet we will be saved. When we come into Christ, he makes us holy, yet he's making us holy, but he will make us holy. So in a very, very much lesser sense, we are ruling on the earth in God's kingdom even now. But at the end of time, we will again be ruling on earth for eternity because heaven and earth will be the same thing. This idea of clouds, and all, all this imagery you know that you get from catholic catholicism and all that other stuff that's just not that's not a good picture 
heaven is on earth. All right. And again, is it literally going to be the actual same planet that we're on now? I, mean, I don't know. I, I, that's the sense that I get. But, you know, exactly what does that mean? I'm not going to, you know, make a clear, absolute, for sure statement. But when it describes us as reigning as priests on the earth, he's talking about the future. In that case, he's looking to the future. But remember, it's already, but not yet. That, that concept of already, but not yet, it is, it's a very helpful theme to understand the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. It's not fully revealed. It's been revealed. It's been partially revealed. And it's being revealed more and more uh, through us as we uh, live in the life of the kingdom. But we will dwell in the kingdom forever. So you have to take such things, each one in their context. But he says, they will reign on the earth. I believe he's talking about the picture in Revelation 22. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. Uh, the next question, if the 144,000 of Revelation 7 refers to the same multitude no one can count, then what is the point of identifying the 12 tribes? Never once in the scriptures were Christians identified or said to be represented by any one of the 12 tribes. First of all, uh, by the way, that's just whoever said that, I love you, brother or sister, but you're wrong. I mean, that's, that's not true. All right. Uh, so, again, the number 12 is the number of God's people. And there's 24 elders. There's not 12 elders. There's 24 elders. The, deep, the, the symbolism is very deep. It represents the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. And we Christians, I, I think we're, I, 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 I'm sorry about that. I, I sense a little bit of arrogance there, looking down on the Jews, all right? Because um, it, like, like Paul said in, uh, in Romans, not all Israel is Israel. We are Israel. We are the true Israel. We are the circumcised. We've had a spiritual circumcision, not a physical circumcision. So. The, to somehow make a dichotomy between the Jews and us, that's a false dichotomy. I mean, you can make that dichotomy clearly because the Jews were under the Old Covenant, we're under the New Covenant, but the Old Covenant is a foreshadowing of the New Covenant. And if, if you're being a, a sort of a prideful, arrogant Christian looking down on the Jews, then go to Romans 14, and he basically says to the, Christ, to the Gentile Christians, by the way, I'm, I'm sort of joking because I'm one of those prideful, arrogant Gentile Christians too. So if, I, if it seems like I'm coming across harsh, I'm, I'm trying to do it semi-jokingly, all right? So please take it in that spirit. But look at, at, at Romans 14 where basically what, what God does there in, Ro in Romans 11 and 12 is he totally comes down on the Jews. You Jews, blah, 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 blah. But then he says to the Gentiles, but don't you dare be arrogant because you are an ingrafted. To the, and those guys, they're the original natural branches. You're a grafted in branch. All right. So the, the symbolism of the 12. Yes, exactly. We, we, that's us. We are the Jews. The Jews are us. Jesus didn't come to end the, the, the law of Moses, but to fulfill it. He is the fulfillment. And so, uh, you know, uh, the, the symbolism here to, to kind of somehow separate the Jews from, from the Christians, uh, you know, that, that is the mystery, right? In, in uh, Ephesians 1, in Ephesians 3, it says, this is the mystery that Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. So we are well represented by Benjamites and Judahites and Reubenites, that's us. We are them and they are us. All right? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother John. I think uh, uh, by doing that, you have already answered another question, okay. which in fact asked uh, the same thing about uh, whether this uh, 144,000, do they represent both Jews and Gentiles? Yes. So we got the response from you. Oh, that so, it, it um, says right here, I'm going to interrupt you. It says, 
Because later on he says, who are these? In verse uh, 13, who are these people? And he says, there's those who came out of the great tribulation. It's, it's Jew and Gentile. And then in verse 9, it says, a great multitude from every tribe, people, nation, and language. There you go. Great, great. Thank you, John. And uh, now, uh, this. Uh, so in chapter 5 and 6, if it is a vision of the throne of God, uh, is it talking about, is it happening in heaven, but on earth? All right. It's in heaven. Because remember, like I said, at the end of time, heaven comes down and heaven and earth become one. Okay. Before that time, there's the heavens and the earth. That, that's a good question. I like that question. You could think of it as a tricky question if you want, because it is sort of tricky. Because in Revelation, there's things on earth and there's things in heaven. And those are very different places, very different places. That's why it's easy to get confused about how it is at the end. Are we up there or are we down here? Because the picture of Revelation, there's up there and there's down here. The, a picture of Ephesians 6, there's up there, there's down here, right? But heaven and earth become one, all right? There's a new heaven and a new earth, and they are the same thing. It is the city of God. So the answer is, unlike the earlier question where I said it's the same thing, no, they're, they're not the same thing. And, and so there's... Because there's the tabernacle on earth and there's the tabernacle in heaven. And Jesus, it, it says in Hebrews 9, that there's already priests down there in the tabernacle on the earth. Jesus ain't down there. He's up there in, in the heavenly one. So in the book of Revelation, they are two separate places, two very separate places. But remember, in Revelation 21, the sea of glass is no longer there. And we walk into the city. So the two become one. Amen. That's my understanding. I, I might be exaggerating here, but that's my understanding. Amen. That was a great question. I love that question. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, Jacob, do we have...